Well, the World Health Organization has said South Africa's efforts to produce vaccines are key to helping the African continent become more self-sufficient in inoculations to combat COVID-19. WHO Director Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus said there was an urgent need to increase local production of vaccines in low- and middle-income countries. Tedros was visiting Cape Town to, vi to view three facilities that are starting to work to manufacture vaccines. Let's take a listen. The scientific triumph has been marred by vast inequities in access. More than half of the world's population is now fully vaccinated. And yet, 84% of the population of Africa is yet to receive a single dose. Much of this inequity has been driven by the fact that globally, vaccine production is concentrated in a few mostly high-income countries. With Africans' announcement last week that it has produced its own mRNA vaccine based on publicly available information about the composition of an existing vaccine. And when I met uh, Petra uh, this morning, I said, uh, considering all the developments, I said, our baby is in good hands mm. and it will grow stronger. And it's a strong, a, a, a strategic solution for the problem that we're facing now. Those are indeed more promising uh, sound bites than the first report. Uh, but to bring all of that into perspective, uh, we're now joined by Dr. Rukewe Ugumba, an associate professor of medicine and consultant on family health. She's the president of the NGU at Jesumari Empowerment Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Ugumba. Good morning. Good to have you join us. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Very nice to be here again. Nice to see you. All right. Thank you very much. Always I'm, in, good. I'm in the Abuja studio. I like being in Lagos as well. So uh -huh. oh, great. nice to see you so far. <laughs> All right. Always good to have you. <laughs> Uh, well, the Tony Blair uh, Foundation has been on this uh, a vaccine matter for, for a while, at least since uh, uh, the beginning of last year. Uh, but not much has changed. And now is giving an advisory that is uh, timely, that is necessary, uh, six months that the world will need to come, uh, the world will need to come to Africa's rescue, uh, six months. How realistic... Uh, do you think that uh, this new call from the Tony Blair uh, Foundation will be, given the fact that, um, you know, people in two years of COVID-19 have survived four waves, uh, people are getting back to their lives, and, and then, you know, we're still discussing availability for, uh, of, of vaccines. How, how realistic do you think this will be? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I mean, um, you, you said it all. Um, the, it's COVID-19 actually started in 2019. And so this is 2022. And we really experienced this um, pandemic for two years, as you said, with several lockdowns and so many problems um, with um, access to vaccines. Now, this Tony Blair Institute has um, sounded this warning um, bell and this alarm. The main reason we're still talking about um, vaccination because um, of mutations of the virus. We, we saw the latest Omicron virus being so infectious, but less deadly than, say, the Delta variant. But the virus is still here and it's still mutating. And even though we can say, OK, Nigerians haven't died, so many Nigerians have, like you say, going back to their normal lives, um, we still can't take anything for granted. We know for a fact that the vaccine is the surest way to prevent serious disease and deaths from COVID. And so that's why we're still talking about that. And of course, the six month um, mandate. Now, there's two problems with vaccines. Obviously, we don't have them. And so we're getting relying on donations. I know the president talked about um, Nigeria making its own vaccines, but I've not heard of the cl clinical trials or um, the actual, I've not seen their branding for their, our Nigerian vaccine. So let's just assume we don't have those. So even if we get the donations, there's this something called the absorption capacity. How do you get the vaccine from the donor to the arm of the, of the um, citizens? This is a big challenge because of um, lots of issues with transportation, storage, even personnel. And so, and of course, we have vaccine hesitancy uh, where people are like, you know, saying that the vaccine is very harmful because of all the um, fake stories out there and all the um, disinformation and misinformation about um, the harm 
usefulness of these vaccines, which are really not founded in science. And so these are the issues that are um, going to bring this problem about this six month uh, mandate. So where are the vaccines? Who's donating them? We've had several people saying they're going to give us. OK, so they're here. How do we get them to do And What is the NCDC doing? And uh, many people till today, if, even they want the vaccine, we don't know where to get them. And of course, like you said, Africa is less than 10 percent vaccinated, whereas Canada, where we uh, reside normally, we have 80 percent uptake, even though there's still a big backlash. Even in Canada, I'm sure you heard about the truckers um, blocking the, the Capitol Hill because they were fed up with all the rules going back and forth from the United States. They don't want to take the vaccine. And many of them are anti-vaxxers, but some of them are just fed up with all the restrictions. And so there we're getting a lower uptake of the vaccine as well. So these are many, many problems, even in the developed world, how we can get this vaccine uptake to herd immunity, which is where we need to be to be able to stop this pandemic. Currently, we're still in the pandemic and there's no end in sight. So what is Nigeria going to do? We need to get the federal government involved. Again, when the president talks about um, Nigeria making vaccines very exciting, but we're not there yet. The vaccines that are coming in, how are we going to get them to the arms of the population? How do you get the population to take these vaccines, knowing that um, a lot of people even have already had the Omicron and um, they obviously didn't die from it? And we still have to keep talking about it because as the virus keeps mutating, new, more lethal strains can come. And until that time where we say the pandemic is over, we have to treat this as a very serious disease. So the media, you guys, we have a lot to do. The, the public health sector has a lot to do. The traditional rulers, everybody has work to do. The people who know need to tell people who don't know, get your vaccine. Where these vaccines happen, we need public announcements. We need text messages, like you said, the MTNs, the Globacom. They need to partner with government to get people to know where the vaccinations are happening. And knowing that even one, two, three doses are not even sufficient now. We, we have the third dose and some countries are doing fourth dose bo uh, boosters mm -hmm. because we know that once the immunity from the vaccination wanes down, you can then get the virus again. Now, the essence of vaccination really, or even getting natural infection from the virus, means that when you then get exposed to it, you have antibodies that will fight for you. Then you don't end up very sick or, or die from it. And this thank you, is where we're thank you for that clarification. To. We know that this COVID-19... Yes, yes, because, you know, sometimes we'll people not, may yeah, still at this go, point... We know it's going to be here for this year. People may still at this point think that uh, a vaccination Sorry. is um, some sort of barrier that keeps you from from contracting COVID-19. And we all know that that's not the case. What it is is a, 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 a layer of protection so that if you do contract it post-vaccination, you're less likely to have a fatal outcome from it. So it is very important, as you've said, that populations are aware. But there seems to be a disconnect. If we use countries that you, you mentioned, Canada, if we use the United Kingdom or, or wherever else, whatever, what other country that has a very strong inoculation um, program for now, if we mirror that to Nigeria, what is the most important thing that people should focus on? I think aside from actually having the vaccines available, there does seem to be a sensitization process that should be ongoing so that people are aware it's on your mind. You are getting messages. Um, it's something that you see when you turn on the television. How much further do people need to go in terms of government, federal, state governments, private businesses, what role do these people play in making sure that the option to be inoculated or the information for the benefits is, is adequately given to the people across Africa, but certainly here in Nigeria? Right. Um, so, yeah, you, you said it all. I mean, um, you can't give the information enough. Um, the more you talk about something, the more it gets out there. You know, even in between um, when you're talking about um, ads like this, you know, you le let people know that the vaccination is really important because the pandemic is still here. Now, the other thing that you said about the public health awareness campaign, this is huge. 
uh, I saw somewhere, I think it was in Ireland, where there was actually some posters on, on as you drive through with anti-vaccination campaigns, which is really dangerous because they were all false things. And I don't know what freedom of information is out there. But here we're not even getting enough of that being said. Many people don't even believe that there's a COVID pandemic. They think it's a government chop chop um, scheme where people are trying to do, um, you know, things to you. Some, some say they're even trying to um, modify the population growth by um, reducing fertility and all sorts of things. And we know that's not true. So we need to get the correct information out there. We need to still emphasize that vaccination is really the most, um, I would just say the best evidence we have to preventing deaths and severe illnesses from COVID. We know that we don't have the ICU beds. We know we don't have the tertiary institutions that can absorb very sick people. We don't even have the oxygen that will go around. We have 200 plus million people. And so we can't afford to catch this virus in the way that, um, they just say, the West had done. So we're very lucky in Nigeria. I think there's some protective measures. And, um, you know, they talked about the chloroquine initially. And there's some, you know, some researchers said probably having some immunity against malaria does give you some immunity against severe illness from COVID. Again, there's a lot of research that's not been done. But we know that Nigeria has been very fortunate in terms of the burden of disease from COVID and in terms of deaths from COVID. Still... We can't be complacent. We can't um, rest in any hours at all because the virus can take a turn. The virus is still mutating, trying so hard. So everybody still needs to be on board. I've seen, I've been around in Nigeria. There's not much masking is going on. I mean, the social distance, distance is not happening. If you go to the airport, everywhere is jam-packed. People are rushing for their flights. And, you know, so there's lots of exposure to people. And, yeah, in the airports, they say wear the mask, but many, many people are not even wearing it um, properly. And, of course, if you go to an O and bear, there's no masking at all. So we're still going to have to rely on vaccines and, um, you know, of course, the natural infection, like, we were discussing the other day that is Omicron actually a, a good thing? Like it's so infectious, a lot of people got it and then they now have antibodies from Omicron and protecting us. You know, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, we're saying, yes, catch the virus, but get the vaccine. And we really need to still emphasize that the government of Nigeria needs to make vaccines accessible by us making our own vaccines instead of relying on people to give us. And if, even the transportation of those vaccines are less cumbersome if they're within country than imported. <coughs> and of course, we need to train more people to, to give out the vaccines. So yes, we're still talking about vaccines even in 2022. We're still talking about a pandemic in 2022. We're hoping the pandemic will be over. I'm sure you saw what happened in the UK. We don't know whether it was a backlash from um, parties during COVID that made them relax the, all their laws. But in England now, there's no mask mandate. You can you can wear a mask if you like. But again, we know the optical vaccine is much um, higher there. And so in general, many countries are really relaxing the rules because, you know, um, the pandemic is really weighing down, if you will, and no more um, so many hospitalizations or even deaths from the from the virus. Again, we know that the herd immunity is almost here. And but we keep need we keep need to keep talking about that where we have less than 10 percent. Um, vaccinated in Africa and certainly probably lower in Nigeria, who has that actually one dose. And, and, you know, so if the virus really comes again in a huge way, we're, we're still going to be a very much risk. So, so yeah. yes, you have to help the government. We have to help the government. We have to keep talking about this. Well, all right. You are also a rising political player in Delta State, right? And you have used your resources to assist or support issues affecting the well-being of girls and young women. And you have also supported a number of legislations seeking to protect the vulnerable demographic. Now, talk to us about that. I mean, I, I believe this is the bill for an act to make comprehensive provisions for the prohibition and punishment of sexual harassment of students by educate in tertiary educational institution? I mean, this is a mouthful. I mean, is that bill comprehensive? Is that the um, actual title that you are giving that bill? Uh, talk to us about that. Okay, I'm sure you're talking about the bill that the Deputy Senate President um, um, actually um, proposed and um, is it um, passed through the both houses and so it's now ready for the President to sign it into law. Now, um, I'm very excited about the bill. You're a very beautiful female. I can see you. And I'm sure you went to university. And um, it's true that even I, when I was in school, um, we did have 
some of the times your lecturers will be attracted to you, but there shouldn't be um, penalties for that where you're not, um, first, first of all, it should be not legal for your lecturer to approach you for a romantic encounter. I mean, that should be clear against the rules. Just like, again, I would just go back to Canada. Recently, there was a doctor who was um, giving inappropriate gestures to to a colleague, and he's been he's been fined um, three months of his um, of his license. He's been banned not to practice. This is not even a patient doctor encounter, which would be similar to a student and lecturer encounter, because the lecturer is in a position of power um, where he can give marks and marks exams. Like the doctor is in a position of power, you should never cross the line with such things. So this bill, this particular bill, for me is coming a day. I mean, it couldn't have come sooner, okay? Um, where lecturers know that there are severe penalties for trying to sexually harass um, the female student who, who are vulnerable. I know male students are also vulnerable in certain climes, not so much so in Nigeria. So that's why it's more a female gender bill. But in general, females are always struggling in every sector, in most parts of the world. I'm talking in politics. In, in jobs, even in, in big corporations, in Fortune 500 companies, and certainly in universities. So for me, it's a very worthy bill, and um, I've, I've not studied it to the large extent um, of what the extent of the punishments would be, but I know that the lecturers were kicking against it, and they didn't really want this to come to life, which is really shocking, because if you're doing your job and you, you, know, you want to um, approach a student, you just know that you can't. And most of these lecturers are actually married, married men. And so, you know, and we've seen all kinds of scandalous videos on, on the YouTube of um, states where girls would set up their lecturers actually to, to force them to be exposed because if the investigation went on, there'll be lots of denials and reprisals and all, all whatnot. So yes, um, we have a foundation called JC Marie Empowerment Foundation where we've been supporting young girls and, and children. It's actually focusing on women and children. And of course, we have not left the men um, behind. Like I said, I still talk about the boys who are subject to um, some, some harassment as well from female lecturers. It's not, it's not a one-way thing. But mostly, like I said, in Nigeria, the girls, again, the culture has changed from when I went to university almost 30 years ago now, uh, where um, most of the time, um, the girls in school stay in school and work hard in school. Right now, you know, the culture in Nigeria is not really quite the same if you go across the universities. I, I'm sure you know the social ills. And of course, I, I saw on your show the other day, they talked about um, Yahoo Boys and all kinds of things and all kinds of things are going on now driven by money. So um, girls don't really stay in school. They're going out, whether with politicians or, you know, um, big CEOs of different things. Instead of staying in school and then they perhaps don't do the work. And so they're now vulnerable to these lecturers to be able to pass. And so, again, this bill will be very, very wholesome in, in checking and balancing that and shaming and naming these lecturers and um, consequences for deterring the progress of females. You know, in Nigeria, I think the population is almost equal between male and female. And the marginalization of females is so stark that we really need to address that. So if a child, for example, a girl child is not properly educated, um, she doesn't really occupy the space that she would in society. You know, the same positions that the men will have, whereas we're almost equal in terms of our numbers. And so we really need to look at that. How do we start from the beginning to the end of educating a woman? And how do we give them opportunities to show up in society? We are not doing that adequately. And I like the term he for she. And this is one of the things that this um, senator has been known for, you know, promoting women, fighting for women. I'm sure the other day you saw there was a big conference about um, including more women in politics and um, the APC um, and rallied that up and I think the president's wife was also a guest there and she spoke how they want to give women more slots in, in terms of um, elected positions and ev even including them in, in appointed positions. And so it starts from there, okay, from how the child all is educated in right, the tertiary institution, Dr. how she's going to go into 
Yes. All, all right. Yeah. I mean, before we let you go, because we're almost rounding off, I'd like to, you know, put in these two quick questions. Uh, first, I mean, for those who are genuinely looking for um, um, informed opinion uh, about the, again, I'm coming back to COVID-19. Uh, have, you, have you read anything about the correlation between uh, either the vaccines or uh, the infection itself uh, spiking up cases of HIV? Are there any correlations? I mean, should we be worried about anything? That's one. And secondly, uh, you are speaking with us from Abuja. Uh, I know you've played a role in uh, Delta. You've been in the corridors of power in Delta State. Uh, as we approach 2023, um, where, will you, where should we expect you to uh, play an active role uh, in the coming dispensation if you're interested in it in Delta or in Abuja? Hmm. Very loaded questions. So the first question about HIV relationship with COVID. Yes. That was the first question. Yes. So the studies, there's no, there's no, there's no correlation as far as the studies show that COVID makes you more vulnerable to HIV because how you contract HIV is very, very different to how you contract COVID. Okay. We know HIV is a sexually transmitted disease, whereas the COVID is a respiratory type of person to person without that intimate contact and transmission. We also know that whenever you catch any infections, your immune system is weighing down and the lower immune system means you're more vulnerable to catching infections. For example, if you had COVID and you had an unprotected sexual encounter, you'd be more at risk, for example, to catching HIV. We know that HIV actually is not as um, transmissible as we once thought because some prostitutes in Kenya um, were studied some years ago and they were some of their customers were HIV positive, whereas they didn't have HIV. So that is the basis of trying to get an HIV vaccine, which has been worked on, and we're seeing some clinical trials going on now. And so that's very, very hopeful because we know that most viruses will get a cure if we know how to prevent them. And that's from your T cell and your B cell antibodies. And so that's the basis of which we create vaccines. And sometimes like this, um, respiratory infections, including the influenza, even the COVID, we cannot prevent you catching the infection, but we can prevent severe disease and death from them. So you get antibodies from them. And then, like you said, we're trying to get this pandemic to be like an endemic, like an annual seasonal thing. Now, so I hope that answers your question regarding the correlations. Uh, we really want no new infections for viruses. We know viruses in general, um, come because we don't have very strong immune systems. And how do you build your immune system? Good diet, good exercise, and vaccinations. That's how we know. We have childhood immunizations that prevent lots of infections from childhood to elderly. And some even elderly, like pneumococcal vaccines, which are not necessarily um, viruses, they're bacterial um, infections, but we give them to certain immunocompromised people, like people with um, kidney disease or diabetes or certain age, to prevent them getting pneumonias, which will now compromise them and kill them. So vaccines have a huge role in boosting our immune systems, as well as your lifestyle, your diet, et cetera. So I, like I said, we, me, I'm a science um, person. Of course, I'm a physician, a professor of medicine. And so we go with evidence um, to, to treat people. And we know that vaccines actually work especially when they've gone through the proper channels. And we know that these COVID vaccines and any COVID vaccine actually is better than none. And, you know, in, in the beginning, there was one, two, three doses and some, even Johnson & Johnson are pushing for a second dose. So get a vaccine, anyone, let's do it. Even if it's um, from the Nigerian made one, like I said, we're waiting for that. Regarding politics, <laughs> it's a very interesting question because um, we're still consulting. We're still consulting. I don't want to tell you that I'm going to be this and that, but I know that um, I did run for the House of Reps in 2019, and unfortunately, I didn't um, get elected, even though my party got elected. I am a member of the APC, as you know, um, and I'm still in the APC, whereas my state is a PDP state traditionally. When I was a special advisor, I was in the PDP, and we moved um, from the APC, and you know, you know how politics goes, eh? and of course, um, my principal then, who was, uh, who was a special advisor to move to the APC, I think is back now to the PDP. Again, this time, this election, we're talking, let's hire competence. Let's hire competence. Let's forget about party lines. 
I know that it's very difficult to say, oh, Delta is a PDP state, you are in APC currently, how do you hope to achieve anything? Let's go and look at the candidates, um, because in the end, no matter who gets elected, we're going to see serve the people. We're not going to say, oh, this is APC person, this is PDP person, no. We're going to um, serve the whole population. So me, myself, speaking for myself, I'm definitely interested in putting myself forward. I'm interested in putting candidates forward who are the best that can fit the bill. And that's what we should focus on right now. Absolutely. I'm very excited with the new um, uh, electoral bill. I have to talk about that. Dr. Ogumba, we can't hear, unfortunately. Unfortunately, um, yeah. Dr. Ogumba, we won't be able to talk about the electoral <laughs> bill, but we wish you well in your consultations and, and future endeavors. Thank you for speaking with us.